Holy God, may your word be spoken, may your word be heard. Amen. Please be seated. Hard texts for hard times. Said that last week. Got to say it again this week. We encounter today one of the most powerful stories in the scriptures, the sacrifice of Isaac. And for us, I think it's very hard to relate to this story. We just naturally revulse in experiencing the idea of a parent sacrificing a child. It's just, on a gut level, horrific, and to be rejected. I think that's true of the idea of sacrifice in general, though, if I may. And, and I think this is true culturally. I don't know what's true for you personally about the idea of sacrifice. But I think for us culturally, we, we've lost some sense of the goodness of the word sacrifice. I think it's been used and abused. And sometimes we recognize calls for offering something up, and we have that same response of revulsion. And sometimes, rightly so. Let me give you an example. A couple of months ago, I think it was a couple of months ago, the Lieutenant Governor of Texas, a gentleman named Dan Patrick, was on a news program, I think it was Fox News, and they were talking about the struggle between trying to contain the coronavirus by having people shelter in place and shutting down the economy, and the importance of opening back up so that people can earn livelihood and that the economy can carry forward um, our lives. And um, he said something to the effect of some people will have to be sacrificed. We can't just stay closed for just a few people and ruin the economy for everyone. The reaction to that in the wider political sphere was pretty swift condemnation. The idea that we would sacrifice those most vulnerable to COVID-19, the elderly, those with pre-existing medical conditions, so that people could go out to dinner in a restaurant just seemed morally repugnant. That idea of sacrifice was, I think, rightly critiqued that the governor was expressing. Yet, I think about how sacrifice has a real a real, and we're in the, back in the parent-child realm, a, a beautiful quality. I think about parents who sacrifice for the well-being of their children. Struggling, working-class parents working two jobs, three jobs, so that their child can get to college and have a better life. That's like the quintessential American story. One generation sacrificing for the betterment of the next. I just say those words, I think about my mom, I think about my dad, the things that they did to help me out. I, I'm warm, right? I'm, I'm not revulsed. I'm attracted to that idea of sacrifice. So there's something about this concept of sacrifice. There's virtue in it, even if it can also be abused. So what about this story of Abraham and Isaac and sacrifice? What about this story? Wish me luck. I should say, say a prayer, right? We're in church. Not luck. It's not Speaking luck. with ordinary metaphors because of our limitations. There you go. So this story has befuddled Christians time and again. And it's made us, it's made us pause and think about who is God, that God would ask such a thing of Abraham. And you know what? As Christians, we're not alone. Our ancestors, our elder brothers in the faith, uh, our Jewish rabbis, through the centuries have wrestled with this story. And they've done midrash, they've done exegesis around the text to try and, and relate to it in some moral way. I'll give you an example. Some rabbi, so I'm, I'm, I'm a priest, I'm not a rabbi. If I were a rabbi and I couldn't name the rabbis who share this with you, right, I should be thrown out of the, the, rab, the rabbinic circle. But I, I'm repeating things that I've heard. Um, in my course of my education. Uh, in the Middle Ages, the rabbis, trying to understand this text and the Midrash around it, thought that Isaac was 13 years old when God made this command, which meant that Isaac was old enough to choose and that Isaac was willing, was willing to be sacrificed. So it wasn't that 
Abraham, as the parent, was forcibly taking the life of Isaac. Isaac was a participant in it, which changes the moral calculus. Still a horrific story, but it profoundly changes the moral calculus. If Isaac was of age, understood what was happening, and was willing as a faithful person to participate. That's an example. Other scholars, as they, they've approached this story, they, they think about ancient times. And here's something horrific about us as human beings. We've practiced child sacrifice. Right? It's in our history. It's in our DNA. It's a dark legacy of who we are and things we've done. And that this story is an example of the biblical tradition, the God of faith, calling human beings out of that darkness to say, stop doing this. This does not please God. Eventually, child sacrifice started to fade out of uh, human practice and history, and maybe this story had a role in that. It's, it's a decent reading. But the part of this story that, that I think sticks with us, it certainly sticks with me, is Abraham as an individual hearing God's voice, asking him to do this awful sacrificial act. And Abraham having to, to weigh that out. What do I do with this? And that part, that part, some of our more recent ancestors in the faith, I'm thinking of philosophers, some outside the faith, I'll clarify that in a second, have just gotten as deep as they can into that experience of Abraham. I'm thinking especially of the Danish philosopher slash theologian Soren Kierkegaard. How many of you ever heard of Kierkegaard? Kierkegaard was a prolific writer, died as a relatively young man, and just devoted himself to exploring deep themes of philosophy and theology and faith. And he wrote a book called Fear and Trembling. And in Fear and Trembling, he unpacks this call to Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And he plays out all the different things that might have been going on inside of, inside of Abraham. But he comes down to this place of Abraham heard what was going on. Abraham heard clearly God's call and said yes to it in an act of faith. And it makes no sense. It is a profoundly irrational act. It's something that Abraham did in response to God's call that does not make any moral sense whatsoever. And for Kierkegaard, he names that there's an aspect of our faith life that's irrational, that will never make sense. It will never make rational sense that Jesus rose from the dead. No act of logic and reason will make that true for us in that sense. To accept it, we need to take a leap of faith. Kierkegaard coined that phrase. I suspect you've heard, a leap of faith. I don't know if he coined it. He at least got it into the lectionary, the lexicon of Christian writers uh, after he uh, wrote it in Fear and Tremble. In the 20th century, Jean-Paul Sartre, carrying on the philosophical existentialist tradition and not coming from the circle of faith, said Abraham bears some responsibility for accepting that this is God telling him to do this. He should have resisted, or he had the right to resist what he heard the voice of God saying to him as an immoral act. That, that's a powerful critique. Here's why I think it's important that we connect it to all that unfolded in Abraham's life up to this moment. All that unfolded in Abraham's life up to this moment. And it starts with the very first line of the reading. After all these things had unfolded. So the text itself is inviting us to see this moment in relationship to what's going on before. And in the story, remember, Abraham gives to, God gives, excuse me, God gives to Abraham and Sarah a promise that all the world will be blessed through their ancestors. And that child who will carry that blessing forward into the world has not yet been born. And Abraham and Sarah come up with a plan. They have Abraham conceive a child with Sarah's handmaid, her slave. And that's Ishmael. And Ishmael becomes a source of conflict and tension in the family. 
and they get kicked out and then they're brought back in and then God visits Abraham and says a year from now Sarah will have a child and Sarah hearing it does what what she laughs because it's absurd that a hundred year old woman will have a child but she does she has Isaac so God, who had made this promise that all the peoples of the earth would be blessed through this couple, through their children, that child is now in the world. And conflict unfolds again, and Sarah just demands that Abraham sends out Hagar and Ishmael. And God speaks to Abraham and says, do not fear for them. I'm going to take care of them. Send them out. Do as Sarah asks. And God does that. We heard that story last week. That heartrending story of Hagar crying out to God, her child left a bow shot away because she can't bear to have the life go out of it. And then the angel comes and offers comfort and sustenance and blessing. Those are the things that happen that lead up to this moment. Oh, shoot. So I was recounting that the narrative that led up to this moment this moment where God comes to Abraham and says, take this child and sacrifice him to me. It doesn't say to me, sacrifice this child, but the context is clear. But something else about the text, this is why it's so important to pay close attention to the story. That's not all that this voice of God says. Take Isaac, your son, whom you love, it recognizes the relationship. The voice recognizes the relationship and calls Abraham to do this thing. They go off on the journey. Abraham doesn't go alone. Two servants come along with him, along with Isaac, along with Abraham. They get to the place, the mountain, where this act is to take place. And Abraham says to the servants, stay here with the donkey. Presumably they're about to go up and it's an ascent that wouldn't be good for the, the beast of burden. And the boy and I will go up, make the sacrifice, and come back to you. I think that's worth paying close attention to. The boy and I will go up, make the sacrifice, and come back to you. That gives us reason to think, reading it as it is, that Abraham has an expectation that whatever is happening, whatever God is asking, Isaac and Abraham will come back together. He doesn't know how, but he believes it. And he believes that because that's the promise that God has made already to him. An encompassing promise that all the world will be blessed through this child and all of the ancestors of Abraham and Sarah that are going to come after Isaac. So what Abraham is in the midst of is a tension attention of promises. He has the overarching promise that God has made, that he believes that his ancestors will be like the stars in the sky and the sand in the beach. More than can be counted and a blessing to all the earth. And now this promise, this command, excuse me, to give Isaac up. Here's what I see in this. Here's what I see in this. God always calls us out to wholeness in our souls and spirits and bodies. God calls us out to be whole people. And if there's a part of us that's unconscious or undeveloped, God will meet that part and challenge us to grow. Does that make sense? That's a kind of understanding about who God is. It's not rational, right? It's not logical. But I think it's real and true. I think we experience this. I think we learn from the wisdom of our ancestors who experienced this. I think it's a truth about who God is and who we find ourselves to be in relationship to God. So God is performing this test, as it were. What God is doing is engaging that part of Abraham that couldn't quite keep faith with the promise, the initial promise, that all the, ants, all the people of the earth would be blessed through his ancestors. And with Sarah, conceived a child with Hagar. 
That wasn't the way that God wanted this blessing to unfold in the world. But Abraham and Sarah decided, let's do God one better and try to make it happen anyway. You see where I'm going? When we decide we know what God wants, but we're going to help make it happen in the way that we see, bad idea. No bueno. No bueno. Don't do that. Has you, have you ever done that? I've done that. We've all done that. This is a human reality when we are trying to be people of faith. We do this. Sometimes we do it a lot. And God finds that part of us and seeks to invite us to grow. Which means to not, to not think we know better than what God has in mind for us. But to act faithfully. Whatever that looks like. Whatever that looks like. The horror of this story is what it looks like for Abraham. But there's good reason to believe in the text that Abraham, not knowing how, believes that Isaac will come back from this experience alive. Because that's what God promised. When we find ourselves in places of tension, of competing divine calls, that's an awful place to be. It's an awful place to be. And how Abraham had the grace to move through this, I can't imagine. If you came to me and we had a pastoral conversation and you were telling me that God thought it was time for you to sacrifice your child, I, I can't... I, in fact, I would be mandated to call Child Protective Services on you. Right? But our world's different than Abraham's world. We talked about how bad the world was in Jesus' day, the Roman world. Oof! Let's not even go to Abraham and Sarah's world and how brutal that world was. We're in a different world. We're in a different world. But that core dynamic of having to na navigate within ourselves our sense of what God's promises are, what God's blessings are, and then to act faithfully rather than take matters into our own hands, that is a timeless human truth. And we all, we all experience that. A word to capture that, that has worked for me, that I offer for you, is integrity. Can you hold your faith with integrity? Can you hold the hope and the promises of God with integrity? Which means that we believe that justice is what will prevail in the end. So we don't take unjust acts to try and achieve just ends. We don't believe that the ends justify the means. We think it matters how we act. I think that we've seen that in history in a profound way in the 20th century, in the way that nonviolent protest, just acts to achieve just ends, has changed the world and is changing it at this very moment. That's faith stuff. That's people having faith with integrity. And that we can all do.